Okay. Okay. Being a survivor. Do you identify with that term, survivor? I do. How do you identify with that term? Um, I identify with that term on the basis of trauma. And I've survived multiple kinds of traumas. And that means that there are things about me that are unique to having lived through those things that are different than maybe those who haven't. And then there's like the way like, you know, uh, and you're a real survivor way. Uh, you have to keep going no matter what crazy thing is going on, whatever that means. Um, but I don't believe in it if it means that I'm expected to perform a certain way in the world or sh show certain traits. So what you do for yourself as a survivor, you do for your own self-care? Yeah, and because I want to. Not because the world is di di dictating to me how I survive or what I survive. And so what are some of the strategies you've developed for surviving? Um. I immediately went to something perceptual and not like um, practical on a body level, but, um, but the way that, that I, I never take anything for granted in people uh, about what their inner world is like or what they struggle with. And I, and I am a hesitant because I, I, I don't want to judge because of how deeply I know the things that people can carry. Um, even, even the people who seem the least affected or, or something like that. So there's that. Um, and then there's, uh, I also feel freedom to choose how I'm going to navigate things from day to day, like, like how I inhabit my body, how I inhabit my pain, whether I use a cane, um, the attitude of that at the moment, how I inhabit gender on a given day, uh, how those things intersect when I need to say no to something. Um, how to watch the world happen sometimes without feeling like a player in that world. <laughs> That's the beginning of that list. <laughs> what does it feel like to watch the world and not be a player in it? Um, I mean, like one thing that I have uh, struggled with um, forever is like partying, like going dancing, for instance. Um, it's usually like all the strength I have to make it to a show at night, and then like everyone wants to go out and and part of me wants to go out because I like to dance. And, uh, and I'm in pain. And so I have to decide whether it's worth it for me to try or because maybe the party won't start for another two hours or do I just need to go home and then I get to hear about how everybody went out and and so-and-so -and -so met so-and-so and, and all of the things that happen at night that people do. And, I don't get to do that very much, you know? I, um, yeah, mostly that. And sometimes it's like that. I couldn't go to this event because like I needed to be in bed or, or, uh, or how that gets played out. Mm. How I prioritize my time 
and what it can incorporate and what it doesn't always incorporate. What is being, do, do you identify with being a survivor? Well, I am. Both identified as, I identify and I'm also identified by others as a longtime survi survivor of AIDS. Um, <clears throat> which means uh, coping with the physical difficulties of uh, accommodating harsh medications, side effects, um, which include diabetes and neuropathy and other ailments. But I also have suffered from depression. So I think of how to avoid states of um, incapacity or, you know, avoiding what are kind of classic symptoms of depression, not getting out of bed, not eating, not sleeping. Um, I have been at times medicated. I'm currently not medicated for depression. So I think of, um, I don't know if surviving is the right way, I think of coping. If I use the word surviving, it makes everything all of the problems that I face, both physically and mentally, sound as if they are matters of life and death, which I can't sometimes distinguish whether they are or they are not. I mean, at the moment, I'm, my medications are working, and I'm, I seem to be coping with a fair amount of stress, without completely going under into a depressive state. But I attribute all of that to coping mechanisms, not really surviving. Surviving sounds like I'm trying to avoid dying, which I don't feel close to at the moment. But I think on some unconscious level, um, I'm always feeling the pressure of my mortality. It's something I haven't escaped since I was diagnosed with HIV in my early 20s, and I've been living with HIV longer than I have not. Um, when I was diagnosed with HIV, I was told I had a year to live, and that was in 1988 and I was 23, so, um, or 24. And. Can I ask you about the depression? Yeah. So do you feel that depression happens as a symptom of having to cope with your medical condition? Or do you feel that the depression is out of a consciousness of mortality? Or those things are conflated and you can't really separate them? At this point, they're, con they're conflated and I can't tell where one begins and where one ends. Um, I mean, I know from my own personal history that e from even before I, as a child, as a teenager, I wasn't diagnosed and didn't see a healthcare professional, but I did experience um, states that were similar to what I would come to understand as depression. But I was heavily medicated as a teenager. I started using drugs drinking very heavily when I was around 13. Um, so I think I spent a lot of those years medicated. I also have had experiences of joy, 
and I go in and out of the full range of experiences. Mm. But um, mm. I wonder what it means. When I think, of, I think of the word survivor a lot, particularly around HIV, because I am asked, I'm a person who's been living with HIV for over 25 years. And um, uh, I'm part of a generation of people with HIV who lived um, in New York in the 80s and 90s when the HIV epidemic was at its worst in New York. And I survived, lived, whereas many other people I knew did not. And so I think of being a survivor as someone who has some responsibility to the traumatic events of a particular historical period. But I don't think of myself daily as surviving. I think of myself daily as coping. Hmm. Hmm. I was just thinking about, in this piece that I just performed in Chicago, um, when I originally performed it, I was using this analysis of the Aeneid uh, that my aunt had written because she was a Latin scholar in a small way, but it was real. And, um, um, but in her analysis, she talked about the loss that Aeneas incurred in trying to, to get to the land that would become Rome. And by the time he got to this place, he had incurred so many losses that he was no longer recognizable to himself. And it was actually at looking through paintings, at paintings of uh, wars that he fought and people who he had lost, his journey, realizing who he was, but he needed it to be reflected back to him to see himself. Um, It's making me think about what you're saying about, about surviving through a lot of loss. Yeah. Though, I know it's problematic to relate you to a hero in that way. It's counter to maybe what both of us thinks about being in the world. Well, I, I mean, it, well, I don't think I, I attribute the fact that I'm still alive and living with HIV to dumb luck. No one really understands how the virus works completely, how it advances more quickly in others. Um, it was just really circumstance, dumb luck, and uh, variables that I can't possibly comprehend that resulted in me surviving long enough to take the protease inhibitors when they came out, when they became available in 1996. So I just, I don't think there's any, it's not an achievement. Right, right. It's circumstance, somehow. Does that fuck with you? Yeah, because I don't know what my responsibility is to history. Um, I mean, I used to make do documentaries, maybe I will again, um, specifically about AIDS and living with HIV for audiences of people living with HIV. Um, I've written quite a bit about the history of that moment. I'm, str I'm currently struggling with an essay now. Um, yeah, I don't have an easy relationship to it. 
Um, and some part of me really wishes, I was just completely free of it. This identity of being a person with HIV, of being a person with HIV, um, about having to speak about it. It's a great relief now in my life and career as a teacher and artist that I don't have to talk about being a person with HIV or having HIV. There are many other subjects that I've addressed in my work or I address in my work, but I always return to it. I, can, I can't completely shift away from thinking about what it means to be living with HIV now. And people who have access to, to drugs, people who don't have access to drugs, I think about the social inequities that exist. I think about whether or not I have responsibilities to the dead, and if so, what are they? Just to have to think about that is a, a lot. So I'm told. <laughs> By whom? <laughs> My therapist. Yeah, you're a therapist. <laughs> of course, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> because you don't see that as a question. Well, I don't see that, but you know, I, I think we all we live in, in various states of denial. And denial is a very useful and necessary psychic function. Um, it's, it might seem trite, but it is true that everyone lives in a denial about their own death, or most people do, I think. I certainly do. I'm aware of it in a kind of abstract way. I'll press play and we'll go. Yeah. Yeah, there's a huge difference between the two things, yeah. I don't get it. Because I feel like my partial acceptance of my body makes me able to accept lots of difference in people's bodies and how they live with them but I, I still have a lot of, you know, conflicts with this one. And, and somebody else who's loving it doesn't help necessarily or do anything. But really, well, that's true emotionally, but even just physically with accepting, with what is happening. Someone can't accept it for you. You have to accept it for you, or else there'll always be 
trying to do something that they don't have the power to do. Um, hmm. Because I feel like There could be many reasons not to feel love. And some of those things come from behavior. That's like a mental product. And some of those things come from our relationship with the body at a much deeper traumatic space. And I feel like those things are different somehow. I know. Yeah, that angers me too. Yeah, I was thinking of a few things. I went to this um, porn that my friend made, that my friend made as part of a project, which has a dance. What was it called? A graphic novel. and. Um, workshops with her things, all these things. And um, I was physically struggling a lot and I needed to use the cane. And I knew that that would be a space where I could go and no one would be looking at that or looking at it at a, in a way that would make me feel uncomfortable. Well, I, and I thought, well, that's funny. I'm going to this queer porn that has nothing to do with disability, but the total acceptance of, of identity that, would, that I knew that would be in the room, and that the space had a, a room for other types of difference. But if I was going to a dance space, or oh, I would have to talk to myself 
before I went because I know people would be immediately asking me my body, you know, dancers can't accept frailty, <laughs> you know. It, meanwhile, there's so much self-abuse that happens in dance. So it was just like, but then there are times when I've been invited to things where I know it's relating to identity, and I'm not comfortable with that because I know I have to take on the pressure to speak to something, and, and I feel like I'm required. You know, I mean, I wasn't born with the physical issues that I have, so there's like a before person that existed and a completely ableist mentality about the world that informs my mentality now, you know, then I'm in completely crip circles of artists who have, who, who've been living this way forever. And, um, I feel a degree of privilege inside that. And that makes me feel like I, can't fully identify, it wouldn't be right to do that, something like that. Um, I mean, I've always, I've always wondered about talking with you about this, because we've never talked about our sexuality. I like know about your sexuality from your videos and, uh, or reading, and, but um, for me, my sexuality was really formed by my disability or the accident that I had that created my condition completely informed my sense of identity and and I always I wondered about your age at the time when you came forward as an activist I always wondered about the need that you felt uh, to claim your sexuality and how, how pressure was involved in that choice or need to tell um, and how it influences you now. Well, how does that, how, 
how does that relate to civil rights? <clears throat> like, is it a betrayal to disidentify if identifying is what creates some, some larger ability to create a movement? Yeah. So um, I was thinking about your, the way that you talk about accepting others' bodies and loving others' bodies. And um, I think there's an interesting tension between accepting other people's bodies and accepting one's own. Mm hmm Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Or sometimes it's hard to accept someone else's love because you're not feeling loved or lovable, even if they love you. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Why do you draw a distinction between physically and emotionally? What's the distinction you're drawing? Mm-hmm. 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 Mm. Yeah, they are. Or we draw distinctions. I think it would be interesting to think about those distinctions. I once participated in this discussion group at NYU, um, a documentary filmmaker, filmmaker I knew brought together a whole bunch of other documentary filmmakers, all of whom had made documentaries about various kinds of disabilities or infirmities. Um, and I realized that they, it was the first time, it was one of the first times I had a conversation such as that outside the context of HIV and AIDS. It was about 10, year, or 10 years ago or more. And I began to feel both out of place and a kind of resentment because I felt that what was going on with my body, being a person with HIV, was different than someone with a congenital condition. Um, and it brought up all these issues of volition, choice, um, and because the conditions we were talking about were so varied, um, there really was no discussion of sexuality. And so maybe I was there to bring that, um, but instead of bringing that in a generous way, I was, I kind of felt somehow excluded or, and I also kind of resented being there. This is not, I'm not telling a story I'm very proud of. But it just gave me pause, wondering how there, how various ca categories such as disability are drawn. Mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm. 
Mhm. Uh-huh. Mhm. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Well, um, I mean, the short version is that I was against identity. And um, I was part of a kind of queer, drug, anarchist crowd that in, in the East Village that didn't want to be part of the clone culture of the West Village. But I had to go over to the West Village to get HIV information because it wasn't tra traveling in the circles I was traveling. But I knew somehow the information had reached me that it, I was possibly exposed to a virus because of um, unprotected sex I was having, gay or homosexual, anal, unprotected sex. And so I went to the gay community center and I was welcomed there. And um, well, it was really the only place where you could go to get information and also talk comfortably about how I possibly contracted HIV, um, which I had, but I didn't know it at that time. So I kind of had this conversion experience where I just decided I really loved this community. I want to be part of the gay community. So um, I, and, hmm. but I've always led a kind of queer life. I've had different identities. Now I, I don't really think through the lens of identity, except as um, a set of terms that are necessitated with the goal of enfranchisement, which I understood then. Um,
No, I don't disidentify. The terms have changed anyways. Historically, the terms changed. We, as part of a generation of people who claimed queer as an identity um, or reclaimed it because it was broader and more inclusive than, than what gay was coming to mean. Um, I don't think I really changed. I've always been queer. I've had sex with men, with women, with trans pe people, with queer people. I've been doing that my whole adult sexual life. But when I joined the gay community, and be I became a gay man, um, but my sexuality was then the same that it is now. Um, and I think I, I think many people I know have gone through several revolutions of thinking around identity and what we thought about gender. It's changed significantly from say the early 80s or, um, till now or the early 90s. Um, specifically around the work of, Ju of Judith Butler, but just experientially in my life. The most significant move was separating gender, sex, and sexuality into three distinct categories. But, um, I, I was, I don't think in terms of disidentification, I just, uh, I just, I've just always been interested in, in understanding identities as social constructions and taking on as many as possible. Identity politics, identity politics has always meant to me, um, within the context of art, um, taking on so many identities that the structure can't possibly bear the weight of all the terms. And that's, you know, my, what my early work is about. It doesn't mean I didn't, I don't have periods of confusion around terms. Um, but a long time ago, I recognized that the terms we use to describe our sexualities or our genders or ourselves are impoverished in relationship to the complexity of our experiences. So I just don't sweat it now. Thank you. We have time for just a couple questions. If you have a question, raise your hand and I'll come to you. All right, if you, I mean, yeah, so as part of the Pro program it's required of us to like have this Q and A built in to our hour of programming. So I know it's a lot of pressure because you just saw this thing happening. What what just happened? But there's a lot to talk about around all of the things that we talked about, and we want to know what was either your intention or one of the many things you had hoped would be the impact 
of the silence. Um, we didn't really have any hope in this performance. I'd say like that's not really part of what we're working with here. We're just working with being alive. And so we had a conversation, we had a series of them, and we are performing two conversations that we had and leaving room to listen to the person respond um, while we're performing being each other. So we just kept the silences in there to make space for the other person. And I think, I, I think at least for myself, it's something to listen to Greg saying what I said and for me to have to witness what I said because I don't really talk that much about some of the things that we talked about. Yeah, I just want to say thank you. It's very useful to hear anything you have to say. We've never performed this in front of other people besides us. Um, and I think the, the structure of the performance stems out of each of us, correct me if I'm wrong, because we haven't really talked about this um, in this way, um, stem from each of us wanting to hear ourselves speak, but not as ourselves, or to hear ourselves in another person's body or voice, uh, so that we could better perhaps hear some things that we say. And some of the things we say are things that we've said before, uh, and some of the things that that we say are things that we said to each other in the privacy of the studio that we haven't really ever spoken about before. <coughs> um, and yeah, so I think the silence is, the, for, from, I think you'll get different answers from either one of us. Um, but uh, it's my belief or contention in art that silence is as significant as speech or, um, and that uh, listening is active, as active an activity as um, speaking. Um, so it's, it's a, a, craze, a, a way to create a porous space where um, you and we, both of us live, can consider and reconsider, because what's repeated is a conversation, a conversation is repeated twice from two points of view. We have time for one final question. Thank you. Um, Maris and Greg, I wanted to ask you if you could just talk a little bit about the images projected that, if correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's romanticism paintings and I don't know if it's all German or I'm making that up. <laughs> Um, they might change in the future. Uh, Marissa and I are going to develop this piece. Uh, we're very honored to be able to present it here, and um, we thought it would be it's interesting in the relationship to a humanities festival where, where people give a lot of presentations. There's all different kinds of artists here, but um, this, this is kind of, at least for me, out of my comfort zone because it's not really, doesn't have the framework of an art world event where certain idioms are understood or accepted uh, immediately. But this is to get to your question, which is uh, all the paintings are by the uh, romantic, 19th century romantic uh, German painter, Kaspar David Friedrich, um, whose subject work was the sublime in the philosophical belief system of the German romantics. The sublime is a combination of both joy and horror captured in the same moment. Uh, and the figure that you see in the landscape has a specific name in German called the, the Rückenfigur, which means back figure, which is specific to German Romanticism. And that back figure is actually supposed to be you, the viewer. You're supposed to, it's, it's, it gives you a place from when, within this very large, expansive landscape to stand or and contemplate the uh, uh, scale, um, the almost incomprehensible scale of the, the universe. Um, and I think in many ways, um, 
if I could just go on very briefly, I think that we were thinking, for me anyway, when we were collaborating on this piece, I had in mind a lot of operatic ideas, even though what we're doing is very much against a kind of set of emotive strategies you would associate with naturalist theater or opera, I still had in mind the, we still, and discussed the, the grand themes of uh, the tradition of opera. Well, yeah, and also um, having to talk about life, death, illness and pain in something like this is a kind is a kind of flattening because you can never re really encompass that experience doing a talk or performance or something like that and also given our role here it was it seemed like the intention in inviting us to do this is for us to sort of provide some kind of information about the experience of disability or illness. So it sort of set um, a framework of, of, a, of a type of flattening of what we could ever show of who we are or what our lives are in the sense that, you know, projecting the paintings also flattens that experience of the sublime. So even though, you know, the paintings give us a place to be l located in our stories of our experiences in a way, uh, they also um, run a, pa a parallel of flatness to m maybe what is taken away when we have to do the te telling of that. Thank you very much.